Welcome to another edition of The Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. Please welcome Jennifer Brown, author of How to Be an Inclusive Leader, which seems so has been such a hot topic for the past couple of years. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. So Jennifer, let's start off with you talking about your professional background. Sure. Well, uh, it was pretty eclectic, uh, which is pretty typical for people that focus in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. We come from a lot of different disciplines. Uh, for me, I was in nonprofits in my early days. I really wanted to make a difference. And also, I'm a trained opera singer. So I pursued music and vocal performance as a career. Uh, moved to New York, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, stars in my eyes, all the things. Uh, but unfortunately, through the course of uh, my getting that training, I injured my voice and I had to give it up uh -huh. and um, kind of was forced to find something else and another way to use my voice because I still loved the stage. Um, and lo and behold, I <laughs> found my way to a field called training and development, learning and development, organizational change. Um, really focusing on the role of leaders in organizations, in systems, facilitating dialogue, uh, you know, how to create change that's lasting and sustainable in a system, right? In a complex system. And I loved it. I fell in love with that whole world and I, and it would become my, my new passion. And um, I would found my company about 20 years ago. So um, we've been doing learning and development leadership and DNI for that long uh, way before it was a thing. <laughs> it was very fringy. Um, but it's become, you know, obviously, you know, like a lightning rod for a lot of conversations. Um, so I, I founded the company and, you know, we, we, I grew my team and now today we serve some of the largest brands in the world and focus on creating cultures of belonging in the workplace where everyone can thrive. Um, which wasn't and isn't always the case for many of us. Um, I'll also add, Mark, that I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community. So for me, it, this is very personal work because of the way I felt professionally, really struggling to find my voice, struggling to bring my full self and not be concerned about stigma and stereotypes being applied to me and, and really diminishing me. Um, and, and lo and behold, it's really cool to now be a published author, somebody who is very, very much embracing all of who I am and also a keynote speaker that gets to be on a different stage now. So I, I will sum that all up by saying I was meant to use my voice, just not as a singer, um, but to give voice to what hasn't been voiced. I would exactly what I was just going to say to you, ironically. <laughs> so, so why did, why did you write this book? Well, this is my fourth book uh, and actually the second edition of a first edition. Um, the first edition of How to Be Inclusive Leader was 2019. So a few things have changed. <laughs> uh, so I felt compelled to rewrite it, uh, keeping uh, the structure of the inclusive leader continuum, which is a four phase model that is the centerpiece of, uh, of the, the first and the second book but really updating the context, you know, putting new meat on the bones, if you will, based on everything we learned over those last very intense couple of years. And um, it was wonderful to have a redo uh, because the book, the first edition had found a huge audience that just loved it, felt it met them where they're at, helped them on their learning journey, was not judgmental, was very, has a very inviting tone and a very practical take on inclusive leadership. But the second one I could write, I think in a more, well, more experienced way because I had grown so much over that period of 2019 to 2022, like enormously, it's particularly teaching as I do and have virtually, you know, hundreds of sessions over the pandemic, the, the murder of George Floyd and everything that happened after that. So I had more to say, I had more specific things to share. Um, I wanted to make it more hard hitting. I wanted to make it more direct. Um, and I wanted to, you know, say some things that perhaps I, I pulled punches around, you know, in 2019, I just think we, you know, we're in a place where we can have a much more honest conversation about what's going on and, um, but still kind of keep the essence of the book. So that was really a wonderful experience. I highly recommend it for business you know, writers because the world is changing so fast. And I'm sure we all look back at our old books if we have one and we say, oh, I wish I could write that differently or give that different context or whatever. Um, because we're growing, you know, we're always growing as teachers and uh, learners ourselves. 
<clears throat> no question about it. And I think the U.S. took uh, the U.S. took a big leap forward uh, mm -hmm. in many respects uh, by having this kind of open conversation, which you need uh, and and needs to be authentic. How do you define inclusion? Well, it's it's a word that I think is on the rise in terms of 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 how it's understood and it's used. Originally in my world, we only talked about diversity. We only talked about representation, right? The the counting of the heads. And inclusion is making the heads count. <laughs> so those two are sort of two sides of a coin. They're kind of necessary to each other and they support each other. And one without the other is less effective. So it's important to understand inclusion in the context of diversity because they are often put together. Um, and I, I think inclusion to me stands for the how, you know, how do I get the best out of people's diversity, both visible and invisible? How do I, if I do a good job on getting that representation around that design table or products or sales and marketing or whatever, the, the really, the rubber will hit the road on how do I then unlock and unleash and create enough psychological safety for people to say, well, here are my thoughts or here's my gut or my background and experience tells me, you know, being able to weigh in and feeling comfortable to do that and not just to have the permission, but the encouragement and the blessing to weigh in with all of that wisdom that comes from our different diversity dimensions. To me, those are inclusive leadership skills. There are things like great listening, empathy, compassion, vulnerability, um, transparency, I think one of the biggest, most difficult things for leaders with inclusive leadership skills is that vulnerability piece, is the ability to say, I don't know the answer. I don't know how to approach this. I don't have the lived experience to know. Um, I feel awkward. I don't want to inadvertently you know, cause harm or make someone feel excluded. So the difficulty is, what do I say? How do I approach this? And, and who am I? to be an inclusive leader. I think too, we have a bit of imposter syndrome um, in terms of our identities. I know I, I know for me, I'm a, I'm a white, you know, blonde cisgender woman. I happen to be in the LGBTQ community, which is an invisible aspect of my diversity dimension. But in many ways, I am very welcomed in rooms because of the other dimensions that I carry. I'm, I'm, I have a lot of permission. I have a lot of automatic trust, perhaps unearned trust. Not when it comes to my gender, honestly, <laughs> that's another, you know, wrinkle, but it's interesting to sort of consider, you know, what do we have going for us in a given system and what do we have that's potentially detrimental in that same system, though all of those things can be true. So inclusive leadership is sort of also knowing when do I need to be, I'll use the word ally, when do I need to be the insider who's leveraging and then when do I also need the support of those because I'm an outsider and I want to, I want to be an insider. I want to, I want to benefit from all those things. You know, how do I kind of see myself in a system? And that that's pretty advanced. You know, if I could get people there, then I think we would have fewer people kind of frozen in place in that, in that spot of, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I can use. I'm so privileged or whatever. Like, what do I know? All of that kind of, you know, I don't belong in this conversation. To the contrary, we need everybody using everything that we have. And we particularly need people with power and influence to use what they have. And I don't think everybody sees where they feel that they are privileged because they're dealing with their own problems and yeah. issues and trying to move up the ladder. So they don't necessarily see it. And I think probably, do you think that you have to have more open conversation where you have to listen to the people you might disagree with. You know, like you'll bring that conversation up and people feel like it's a one-way conversation that if they disagree with your stance on this, they can't say anything anyway. But I think it's, don't you think it's better that uh, even if they disagree with you, they're able to say it because now you hear the other side of how they view things, even if, even if you don't agree with it. I think we get really stuck, Mark, in the agree, disagree binary, like the right, wrong stuff. Yeah. Um, I really agree with you that that the best, the most effective leaders are able to hold a lot of different contradictory, nuanced, gray area truths, right? And lived experience is exactly that. It's very subjective. It's it's how I've, you know, walked through the world and nobody can take that away from you. Um it is your experience, you know, and um, I think, but sometimes we, 
other people telling us how they experience things makes us uncomfortable and defensive. And, and then we kind of square off um, against each other, which, which kills dialogue, which kills understanding and empathy. I mean, I think like, for example, if somebody says to me, Jennifer, I just don't have a place, or I feel that if I embrace this, it's going to be less opportunity for me. You know, I could choose to be, make, ha have a reaction to that of like, how dare they, or how stupid or how selfish or whatever. I could judge it all day long, but that's not the energy I want. It's really what I want to ask is I want to understand where that feeling comes from. I, I think, I think dealing with resistance is such a challenge um, to sort of get to the underneath the resistance too, because there's usually under there, there's fear, there's uncertainty, there's um, perhaps unresolved resentment, anger, confusion, um, feeling isolated. Um, all those things I think are actually things a lot of us have in common. <laughs> So if we can kind of get underneath the resistance and understand like, well, what's really going on? What's feeding this? And maybe, maybe there we can give something or offer something that may address the resistance so that it, it vaporizes or it lessens and we can kind of move on together. Um, but to feel heard, honestly, is half the battle I, and to enable others to feel heard. Once that happens, I think some psychological safety is created and then we can go then we can begin to move forward together. But if, if it's not heard, if I'm not heard as a human, then, then we're always going to be battling. We're always going to be stuck at this place of I'm not listening and neither are you. And that's not a productive place. Without question. How has leadership changed over the 10 years and what impact does COVID have? Because I've read so many um, leader, thought leaders in leadership say COVID's really made a huge change in how people manage people and so forth. So what's your take on that? I mean, I think that the vulnerability we all felt in our, in our worlds, and for some of us, it was around, around new, new dimensions, right. Um, or realizing the privileges that we had in the way that we rode through the pandemic, you know, some of us, you know, didn't get sick. We didn't have comorbidities. We didn't have first line responders in our family. We didn't suffer, um, the loss of, you know, family members because of illness and sickness. We we weren't um, homeschooling our children and caregiving for people and working. You know, it's 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 really interesting to think about privilege through the lens of even that, right? Um, but it did change us. I think honestly, some in some ways, working remotely and and going through this together led to a kind of openness and trust of each other that i think was unprecedented in some ways we we saw into each other's worlds you know in some cases for the first time and for some of us that was really scary because we carry marginalized identities that we don't want people to know we we you know if I'm, you know, in the LGBT community and I, my same sex partner was walking around behind me, right. In those early days, right. We didn't have the, you know, the, the, the backgrounds that we have today. And, and I had to come out, you know, or I had to show up, you know, with my own mental health challenges, for example, which also spiked during that time. So the honesty was new, I think, and unprecedented. Um, so I was, I was really grateful for that. I think that, that, that made a quantum leap in terms of what we're okay with asking about and checking in and all of that. But I do fear, um, you know, that we, we are going back to sleep in some ways and getting back to business, you know, you know, and, and this whole hybrid work thing is tricky, not really working well for anybody, honestly. Um, and inclusion inclusive leadership is hard to do well in a hybrid or a virtual place because you don't have any of the cues about someone you don't you don't have the casual conversations you know we meet and we get off the phone and we meet and we get off and it's sort of there's none of this like like fluid time um to our interactions where i might say take you aside and say hey by the way you know i just wanted to share i'm really struggling i, I need some extra support or I, I need a flex work arrangement or you know whatever i, I need to seek some help you know, it, it's, it, there's less opportunity for that, I think, working in this way. So I think what this means is we have to become even more diligent and even more kind of committed to that curiosity and opening that door so that people will tell us what's going on with them. They will seek support. And, and we as leaders have to really calibrate and say, am I, is what I'm doing, how I'm holding meetings, how I'm checking in with people, am I being inclusive of all the different 
learning styles in my team um, and my colleagues, all the different cultural celebrations that people are, are important to people. Are we, are we doing this well? And, and this leads us to, I think, need to seek feedback more often in more, more formats so that we know because we're flying a little bit, you know, blind, if you will, we are not able to pick up on all of everything that we need to know. And then we could lose a lot of people. We, we really could have major retention problems and, and be kind of blindsided by that. And we shouldn't be, we should know where everybody stands. We should know how they're feeling. We should know how engaged they are. Um, but we are in a sort of information vacuum, I think working in this way. So it means we, we've got to up our game in it. And I hate to say that because I'm not sure we were all great at this before the pandemic. So, you know, uh, but, but re- leadership is relentless. You know, if you're not uncomfortable, you're not leading. I like to say, so, you know what, like push yourself really challenge yourself to check in and, and be that new kind of leader, because what got you here to quote Marshall Goldsmith, what got you here will not get you there. And we're in very, very different times and we're never going back. No, no question about that. You write, there are four stages of the continuum, unaware, aware, active advocate to be an inclusive leader. Please explain how this works and how long does it take to master each stage? (laughs) <laughs> well, you're not going to like my answer. There is no such thing as mastery. <laughs> uh, but I love that question because I think that we think about everything in that way, right? In business, we think about this destination and we think about getting the gold star and we think about completing it and our, you know, our, our metrics and KPIs and whatever. Yes. And I think this is more of a journey process, right? If you think of anything that you've evolved through and where you've built a habit and a discipline, it is through practice. But guess what? You stop going to the gym for a couple of weeks and you lose your progress, right? percent of it, yeah. Yeah, so you need to keep feeding it and you also need to keep feeding it because this is such a changing landscape, because vocabulary and language changes all the time. And even for me to keep fresh on the emerging conversations that are going on, I mean, it is challenging and I do this for a living. So. The four phases that you just named, um, I think we kind of cycle through them and we go back and we go forward. And so it's not so much about when am I done? It's about where am I? And, and it's about even deeper than that, where am I on a certain dimension of difference? So if I've got four phases as a learner and I go from unaware to aware to active to advocate, it could be years around it for me, for example, it's been years of understanding, beginning, beginning to understand the experience of a black woman, you know, for example, and what happens for my friend and my loved one, um, for my, you know, trans and gender non-binary, uh, colleagues for, for any lived experience that I don't carry. I am definitely in the earlier stages. I'm in, I'm, I'm coming out of unaware where I don't know there's a problem. I don't care. Uh, I deny that something's important. I don't want it. It's somebody else's job and not mine. And I'm, and I move into the second phase, which is aware, which is okay. Now I want to, I know what I don't know. I need to learn. I need to learn as much as I can and kind of, you know, digest information about different identities and also deepen my own understanding of my identities. I think that's in that phase two aware, which is let me kind of dig into my own biases. Let me think about the, what I was born with or what I wasn't born with and what kind of implications that's had for me. Um, so, so there are certain identities we're going to be further along and more advanced around because we carry them because they are our lived experience, or perhaps we are, you know, our partner is from a different community of identity than I am, or our kids, uh, our community. It can be a lot of different things where we live around the world. Um, so really it's, it's, it speaks to, I think our own evolution as humans, um, to realize what we don't know, begin to awkwardly learn what we don't know, begin to bring that with us into our leadership and become our public in sharing our journey uh, and and hopefully educating others to beginning to, to teach a little more, facilitate. And then that final phase is advocate, which is the phase four. And it's really very advanced. It's um, I am, you know, I think people at that level, they know themselves, they understand their biases, they know how to use their voice, they know the tough questions to ask and challenge themselves and others, and they're unafraid to do that. 
Um, and, and they're very kind of relentless change agents, I think. Um, and that's something that, again, I'm not at phase four about every identity. I'm probably there on a couple that I'm like deeply familiar with, but even those, like I say, are changing constantly. Even the communities I'm in from an identity perspective, there's a constant evolution there too. So, um, so anyway, I think we have to look at ourselves. We are learners. We're always learners. We are, uh, if we're uncomfortable, it probably means we're growing. And if we're not uncomfortable, we're not leading. So the challenge is to push towards that learning edge to say, what do I not yet know? What do I not yet understand? Am I doing enough? Is there more I could be doing? Um, how did I do? Did I have an impact that I wanted? I think too, throughout this whole process of learning, we're only, we are only allies when someone calls us an ally, when somebody considers us an ally. So the work too is, it can be a little mysterious because we can ask our question of, am I making a difference? Am I growing? Am I having an impact? That's the exact right question to ask because we can't actually know our efficacy unless we really understand how it is being received by others. And then we go back, we calibrate, you know, I'll recommend again, Carol Dweck's work, growth mindset is so brilliant. It speaks exactly to this. I mean, I always think it's applied to innovation, innovation in terms of, oh, like let's try, fail, try again, incrementally improve. But we, we are the innovation. We humans are growing and changing and retrenching. And I, I only ask everybody to think about how can you be humble to your own growth? Um, because the ego will be challenged. Our want to have all the answers will be challenged. Our want to complete things and our want to give ourselves like the gold star. I mean, all of that um, is very human as well. But I think the humility is what we've really got to hold on to the agility, flexibility, humility, resilience, um, you know, the listening and the sort of willingness to evolve. Um, that's what we need to see leaders doing. And we need to hear about it. We want to hear about leaders evolution. I think to follow a leader and to have them be really real and relatable, it's not to show up perfectly because that's impossible. It's not to show up with all the answers. It's to be humane. It's to be empathetic. It's to ask the right questions. It's to hold the space. It's to deeply reflect on your place and change. If we had leaders that were more skilled at, I think, and, and willing to share that vulnerably, I think we'd be, I think we'd be making progress. Uh, the focus on diversity and, and inclusion should be a positive for society, really should be, but yeah. it seems to be polarized and is ripping, uh, ripping the country and, and parts of the world apart. Why is that and how do we fix it? I mean, I know we can say people are afraid of change and, and so forth, but, you know, as we're seeing right now, um, especially in this country, in some cases, we're taking steps backwards instead of yeah. forwards. So what's your take on that and, and how can it be fixed? Oh, God. Nice, easy question. <laughs> yeah, I, you know. No, no, it's fair. I, I, I love kicking it around. You know, it's, um, it's hard to, I think we're in a, we're in a backlash, um, which is also part of kind of human evolution, speaking of. Um, there's the, we get out ahead of our skis, perhaps. Um, and you know, sort of there are, whether whoever we have for president, for example, you know, where we had Barack Obama for a while and, and people are like, oh, we're, we're done with racism because we have a black president and then <laughs> clearly not. Um, and we also have had a very progressive conversation about gender identity and things like that. And um, uh, certainly there's the backlash to that and other, other sort of rights and things that have been codified into law. And then companies are really interesting, like stuck in the middle. Um, Really well, battling, Disney. yeah. I mean, Disney's, Disney's really, fight really with the governor of Florida, and I think for Oof. some people, they're. I think the people who don't necessarily agree with Disney mm -hmm. um, don't feel that they're being heard at the same time, and so you're not able to come to common ground with that. Yeah. So how do you get the people to common ground because they don't have to? I'm Jewish and, and there are lots of people who are anti-Semitic and that's never gonna change. And there's sure. always gonna be people who are racist and that's never gonna change. Mm -hmm. But I'd rather, hear, I'd rather hear them tell me uh, and have that discussion than shut yeah. them down. Boy, that's true. And in a way, in a way you could view this moment as necessary, you know, as really, really painful as it is. 
um, would you rather know? Like, would we rather know? Because I don't think we knew um, before perhaps like 2016, I'd say like a lot has been revealed about who we are as a country, about where resistance is, um, about how I think we need to perhaps, you know, message things in a certain way as well. I, I think there's been an inadvertent pushing away uh, and a denial of certain truths like we were talking about earlier. Um, and, and I think, you know, this is, this is a, we're a bit of a, a sick patient <laughs> in the U S right now. <laughs> and maybe we've been denying the symptoms, right? We've been denying the disease, um, the disease of, you know, polarizing from each other, the disease of, you know, you know, feeling so kind of like we don't have shared interests. Um, and, and pre employers are in an interesting spot because they know, they, they know that they are diversifying quickly, their talent, who they're hiring, their audiences. Think about who comes to Disney, right? They're, you know, all of that is changing so fast. And as a brand, they need to stay um, ahead of that and be very, very sort of proactively welcoming. Um, so it's a business decision. Uh, and I think they view it like that. And, and they've actually been a stalwart company for many, many decades. I mean, I've, I've worked with Disney for oh, almost 20 years, um, been sort of privy to a lot of their strategies. And, and so I've understood that the, the stance that they've taken and why they did it. And it's, and it, and it's very objective. It's very like logical to me. It's, it's sort of shifting with your markets. Right. Um, and making sure that you're innovating for those markets. Right. Well, so. But I but, don't think it's necessary, like, I don't think they have, should have to do it for shifting with the markets. I think it's just, it's just how you should treat people. Well, yes. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. I, I'm just a, a logic uh, driven yeah, guy. That is logical too. That is yeah, logical too. and it just makes uh, sense to me. Uh, and I don't want leaders to do it just because it's supposed to be the right thing to do. I want them mm -hmm. to embrace it because it just makes uh, sense to go and do it. Wouldn't that be, I mean, Mark, what you're talking about is the moral case. Um, yeah. and then we, in my world, but we always feel like the moral case has not been enough to convince the leadership, the business world. Um, but honestly, the business case, uh, which is the moral case, I agree with you, but the business case, sometimes you have to argue it, um, because it is the only language that might be understood, right? It's You're, sort of that bottom, whatever. But I totally agree with you that it literally, if I say to you, I don't feel welcome at your theme parks, like or, or my family, I don't feel comfortable bringing my family to go, right? For whatever reason, I don't see myself reflected in the advertising, or I feel like, you know, that, that it's been, it's, it's, uh, whatever characters don't reflect me and my, my family. Um, that's a problem. Uh, but I, but I, but I want to be there. I mean, the happiest place on earth, you could ask a question like, well, happy for whom? Mm. Right. And, and yeah. they've got to cast the widest net possible. Um, but what's, what's so interesting, it is really interesting about it because that makes them a target, I guess. And, and this is the world we're in now. And it's just going to be interesting to see because we, companies are the most respected entities from a trust perspective. So when you, the Edelman trust index is a very well regarded index that's done regularly. And it's not government, it's private employers <laughs> that are trusted brands, companies. So there's so much responsibility for leaders to say, wow, like, what does that mean? We're trusted. Uh, how do we live up to that trust? How do we live up to that expectation? How do we create a safe space for all to buy from us, to work here, to feel aligned? You know, all of that is that has to be taken into account. But I think companies have a ton of power, a ton. And they're, you'll see them, I predict, they're going to have to, they're going to be called on the carpet to make well, some hard decisions. I, um, I don't see up. the governor of Florida winning this battle uh, as mm. Disney will fight it all the way to the Supreme Court. Oh, yes, they will. And I don't care how the court themselves is so conservative. You can't deny that this is just a logical, moral, right thing to do. Right. And and I don't think anybody, they shouldn't, you know, when you say that people don't see themselves in some of these Disney characters and, and so forth, I, I don't think we want to say to Disney, you've got to make this change. What we're saying is, is that you have these guests here. And yeah, it would be kind of nice if they saw themselves <laughs> right. uh, in this or that they're kids, just like all those years you had the uh, blonde Barbie dolls. Right. And why would a, uh, a black child want a blonde Barbie doll? 
Right. And so like, hey, it'd be nice if you made this color tolerant too. And yeah. it just would make sense. We have a question from the audience. Many leaders want to be unifying and generous with long-term vision, but are mm -hmm. challenged by monthly and quarterly earnings reports. How can leaders strike a healthy balance? Oh, it's so tough. I know. I, I feel this question asker. Um, you know, uh, the 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 sort of relentless pace of objectives and the sort of monthly um, numbers on the board, so to speak. Um, I would argue, though, that to get to those results, folks need to feel, and more and more, especially with younger talent, you've probably noticed this that. That 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 ex expectation that I feel, I feel a sense of belonging and comfort here, where, which means I can do my best work, which means that I can be the most innovative, and which means I can develop the most trusted relationships with my colleagues. I actually think that our numbers will be improved through a greater investment in belonging. So to me, these are linked. Like I'll give you an example: when I was closeted in the workplace and I was trying to be productive, but I was managing and doing kind of double work. And the other side of the work I was doing was, am I safe? Do I have to make up stories about who I am? Um, can I bring my full self? Can I trust colleagues with who I am? Um, all of that is incredibly distracting and actually diminishing. I mean, you can imagine it's diminishing to constantly be made aware of your difference, constantly be thinking about it and thinking about the worst part of it is thinking about it and like letting it kind of silence you or making you feel that your contributions are less than. So when you've got people trying to contribute, but through all of that kind of noise and smoke, it's, it's very difficult to be my most brilliant self. So I would say the question is not sort of, oh, I'll get to DEI when I can. It's, how do I create the best circumstances around me through inclusive leadership where I will get the best and the most out of people? I, I think of it like the discretionary effort, right? We all want as leaders to get that extra. And I don't think we give that extra unless we feel a sense of connection and belonging. And in order to feel that, we have to be, I think, more fully seen and heard. So instead of saying, I don't see color, which our generation, I don't know about you, Mark, we were told that was what you should say, believe, think, whatever. Just as one example, these days, it, it difference, I think, is, is, is celebrated, seen, acknowledged, um, um, understood for, for the, the barriers that it brings. And the best leaders in the world will acknowledge some of those barriers. And, and I'll trust somebody enough to say, actually, yeah, I do feel spoken over. Yeah, actually, I don't see anyone that looks like me in leadership that shares my identity. And, and it, 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 I translate that to mean that I can't be it. You know, if somebody approached me in the right way, I would absolutely share, you know, how it kind of feels to be the only, right? So, or, you know, all those things. And, and that makes that leader better to be able to have that conversation with me, but it makes me better too, because now I can like, I can, I can breathe a bit. I mean, I've literally trusted my leader and my colleagues with more of who I am. And it kind of like lets the air out of the balloon. It just depressurizes the whole thing. Um, and trust me, people are carrying around a lot. It's not just race, ethnicity, gender, it's mental health, it's disabilities, in, invisible disabilities. It's all, you know, all kinds of stuff, caregiving pressures, um, grief, loss, um, neurodiversity. So when I pull my audiences, there's just so much going on for people that they're holding and they're burying and nobody performs at their best when that is what's going on. So I think if we can come from that place and link that to results. I think we'll be on our way. I think the leaders got to pull, pull people's comments from all sides. Um, so people don't feel like that they have to bury what they really think. Yeah. Again, I'm always more interested in hearing what people think as opposed to being co politically correct because over time, they'll see things differently if you let them voice their opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, if you keep shutting them down you, and they can't say, well, I feel I'm the one being overlooked now that uh, mm. black people are getting all the uh, mm -hmm. right jobs or gay people or whoever it is, I think they have to be able to voice that and then understand mm -hmm. so they can get it out of their system and then start listening to how the other side feels. And, and nobody can walk in your shoes 
and really truly understand. Is your partner a woman of color? Uh, yeah, actually. Yeah, and yeah. there's no way that any of us can possibly understand what she is yeah. dealing with. Yeah. I mean, we can try to empathize, right? And we should try to empathize, but it's incredibly hard. You had something uh, you mentioned, according to Lily Zhang, uh, author of DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, said leaders often underestimate the time, money, and effort needed to improve DEI. I, I firmly believe that. Mm -hmm. What kind of investment is required and how should success be measured? Oh, good question. Yeah, Lily Zhang is excellent. Uh, good friend. Um, so we need to measure ourselves first. I'll start with our own development and evolution um, on the continuum in, the, in my second book. So please pick that up. Um, where am I? What next steps do I need to take? Um, and just literally developing that discipline, the habit, the repeatability, right. That leads to strengthening that muscle. So holding myself accountable, um, might be simply be setting some goals for my own learning, whether I'm reading different books, listening, to different podcasts, absorbing, um, things created not by and for people that look like me, but others, um, using my voice, examining my biases, um, you know, stepping forward and being more public about my journey and what I'm learning, um, leaders, you know, leaders are watched by a lot of people. So I think as you evolve, you have a real opportunity to inspire people to shine a light on something that hasn't, has been in the shadows to also to practice vulnerability and share perhaps what's under your, under your waterline, like what's invisible about you. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for leadership storytelling there that I think is very powerful. Um, then though, organizationally, um, what I would recommend is if you're in a company that has uh, no diversity efforts, um, we recommend a basic strategy be developed. We recommend a DEI committee is created, which is usually uh, put together with passionate senior leaders from across the business so that you have functional diversity. Um, but also on that committee, you got to watch for gender diversity, race and ethnicity diversity, a lot of the others that things that you're looking for. Um, I would have a committee. Sometimes companies have nothing else but a committee. And from there, that committee leads to strategy development and also uh, beginning training with inclusive leadership training. I would roll, roll out particularly for people leaders at the very, very baseline. Um, and we offer that at my company, by the way, if I can put a plug in. Um, but that should be a lot of what I've talked about today, very hard hitting, very related to the bottom line, very related to um, leadership skills. Um, and then if there are affinity groups possible, and this might be for the larger companies, I would begin affinity groups by identity. So I know this sounds a little counterintuitive for some of you that may not be familiar with the concept, but it's sort of excluding to include. The exclusion, in, in this case, it's a good kind of sort of naming a group, that, that a community that can come together and find some good community psychological safety support with each other, have a conversation about, for example, the LGBTQ group, the Black Employee Network. I mean, I work with a lot of large companies and companies like Dell and Cisco and Disney have like tens of thousands of employees in these groups. So though the scale of that is um, they're like organizations unto themselves. They have entire leadership hierarchies and chapters and strategic plans. And they're there. And some of them are even paid. Some of the leaders of these groups are even paid um, for, for example, um, in Bristol Myers Squibb, I know pays their leaders because it is a job. It is literally like a whole, a whole world and responsibility to say, what is the voice of, for, for example, our black employees at Bristol Myers for black patients, for developing medicine for that community? What are we missing in our clinical trials? How are we attracting the talent that then can help us spot where we're not anticipating uh, those needs? Those are some of the wonderful things that affinity groups can do in some of the larger companies. But if you're just starting out, I would say like pull something together. If we're, if worst case worst, have a multicultural coalition where we, you know, lots of differences could come together and begin to have that conversation about lifting the company up and, and moving it along. So this leads to my next question. According to uh, an article in Forbes in February, employees mm. feel exhausted, burned out, and discouraged due to a lack of organizational support and investment. Doesn't that, doesn't that DEI failure hurt a company's chances of attracting top talent and they lose their edge and how can employees get real buy-in from their employers? Oh, it's such a struggle. Um, because 
so the employee, what happened is I think 2020 was this huge truth telling moment, right? And, and people were asked, there were focus groups everywhere. We led so many, so many listening sessions only to sort of feel that all these promises were made, all these commitments uh, to do better were made. And then, and then there's sort of right now in 2023, a fatigue on, on all sides. I honestly think there's a fatigue on the employee side. There's a fatigue on the organizational leader side to say, you know, we, we really deep dived into this and, and then, you know, we, we were sort of enduring all these other sort of headwinds in the business world, right? Whether it's the economy, it's, you know, the, the continuing pandemic. So, so I think the fatigue and the frustration, I guess, is shared. And I don't know if it's the failure of DEI. That sounds a little extreme. I mean, that's um, what that's what Forbes says. I mean, yeah, we not, yeah. You might not a, a, agree with it. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, a failure of is it a failure of organizations to change as quickly as they could have? Um, and that takes a lot of commitment, firepower, support from the top, vision at the top, because only so much employees can do to change a system. I mean, usually there's more and more kinds of diversity lower in the organizational hierarchy um, and less and less power. So all of that feedback was given, but there has to, it has to be met with senior leadership support, buy and vision, commitment, accountability, right? And so that's how these massive ocean liners that are organizations change, right? They change direction slowly. And they do this because there is a cooperation top to bottom and there's a there's deep listening and feedback going on, and then there needs to be that kind of visionary leadership to say, okay, here's where a year from now, here's what success is going to look like. Um, I think a lot of companies made some promises they couldn't keep in 2020. I was just talking to somebody who who entered in a DNI role, and he said, yeah, when I started, I realized the company had committed to complete gender parity by 2025. <laughs> And he well, said, because no, they're no, used no, to no. setting goals. I mean, like, they're back just, up. Like we can't get there because we're here and we're net. That is yeah. ne even if we get there, we're going to be doing things like artificially to kind of check the box, but it's not going to be real change. Like in the tissue of the organization, it's just going to be sort of for the metrics. You got to be careful. Like what gets measured gets done. I love that. But I also really want to caution folks like the checklist and the sort of sexy metrics, like, and the, the bragging rights of all that, um, you're in danger of solving something superficially versus sort of going the distance. And the distance is what, I, is what I'd like to see, which is, okay, like, let's get deep into, well, why don't we have more gender parity in senior roles? Like, that's the question most companies should be asking themselves. Where do we lose people in the pipeline? Why? Is it because of the culture? Is it because of the lack of opportunity or lack of role modeling or mentoring and sponsoring? Like, those are really meaty questions. Um, those are the right questions. And then, yes, we need to measure ourselves for sure. But, you know, know that um, we've got to, we can't just achieve things superficially because we promised <laughs> and, and many companies aren't even achieving things actually. Um, I think a lot have gone back on their promises and their goals because they realized it was this very kind of unique and unusual time. Um, so I'm grateful for what happened a couple over the last couple of years, but I think that realism is like, Ooh, our problems go deeper than we thought they did. And this solve is going to take a while. So here's a, another question related to what you write in the book. You write about a concept called allyship, and you yep. write this, uh, and you write this. Um, many well-intentioned white people that want to help black and brown communities succeed, but those same people can fall into the white savior complex, mm -hmm. which you mention in the book. How can people contribute to underrepresented groups without getting the label and make a difference? I mean, I think that's very frustrating for people who do want to help yes. and then have this label. And then it's like, oh shit, uh, <laughs> what's the point? Yeah, I didn't do it right. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's a bit of a mixed message. Um, and I, I, I understand why it's a frustration. Like it's a boon to people. Allyship it can help so, so much. And yet the way that it comes across or is done is very imperfect for a lot of us. Um, and the saviorism in particular is, I, I think, simply put, that's, that is, I, I think it comes from this like total enthusiasm 
right? It's, oh, I'm going to, you know, I know a little and I can do a lot and I'm encouraged and I'm excited and I'm going to jump in and I'm going to solve. And the only challenge of that is just that um, I'm not going to necessarily solve things that in the right way. Um, I'm not going to, because of my limitations of my own experience, the solutions I'm going to come in, um, up with may not be the ones that are desired. And so in my zeal, in my excitement, in my empowerment, honestly, and you're, you're Mark, you're so right. People want so much want to do more, but we're trapped a bit by the perfectionism um, that, that plagues us, which is, I have to have the answers. I've got to do this right. The first time I've got to like get a hundred percent because that's a, that's a way we're measured in the rest of life. But this is very different. This is the experimental, I'm figuring it out. Please correct me. Um, here's what I know. Here's what I don't know. Language, which is a very like different way to show up as somebody who's trying to create change. Um, and it really admits, it, it's very transparent about, you know, here's how I'm developing and here's where I, where I might mess up. Here's where I'm awkward. Right. So like if, if again, I think that allyship is only effective if it is received as helpful and I, and the saviorism can be, maybe I want the limelight. I mean, I've seen people call themselves allies and then literally like suck up all the oxygen in the room. Like they're literally the one that is yeah, talking it's for like, political just, reasons. Yeah. And I just saw that yeah. yesterday. Like there was this whole, um, lesbian visibility panel, which is, this is the week that we're in right now. And there were these incredible women on a, on a panel, but there was also a male leader who kept sort of <laughs> moderating the panel slash inserting, you know, self. So I think too, this concept of centering and decentering is something we need to think about in our efforts of where do I need to step back? Where do I need to say less? Where do I need to ensure people say more? Where can I move aside and make room for and put forward people with lived experience that isn't mine, if particularly if I'm in the dominant group or a, a majority group or a relatively more, I'd say systematically privileged group, um, it is about making space for others and also giving platform. Like I know for me, I have a big platform. So when I invite people onto webinars or I, I, I ask guests to join me, it's for me, it's all about giving them voice. Like let me, people have heard from me ad nauseum and people that identify as I do. I think how I can exhibit my allyship is being behind or being to the side and lifting up. And, and removing myself when it's, you know, unless I'm really needed. And sometimes I'm really needed, by the way. And I center myself because I may be in a room, Mark, like with, with maybe all men and I'm in that room and I'm really the only one that's asking questions about things, you know, and I'm, all, I'm the only one that spots biases and things that are getting in the way of, of fairness and equity. That's a, that's a moment when I should center myself because I'm the, I'm the only one that's going to speak if, if, you know, but what I wish is Mark, if you were sitting next to me, I wouldn't even have to do that work because you would step in and you'd say, hold on everybody, because the way you look is perceived differently than the way I look in a room. And you may have more credibility or different credibility than I would. So it's always this like interesting way of using your voice or giving voice to others or like removing yourself or, or, or putting yourself in the middle and, and that can sound very confusing. I understand it's, it's, it takes some practice to figure out what's needed from me at this moment. And, but just, just to watch out for the saviorism, the assumption that I'm going to know how to solve something and, and address it. Because I think what we have to do is ask the people affected, what is most helpful for you? There was one Asian American um, ERG leader, affinity group leader in a company that said it was during the stop Asian hate. Uh, the sort of one of the peaks of that because it's still ongoing, but it was the conversation and the company had made a donation to and written a check to advocacy organizations. And she said, thank you, great, but, but really you should have asked us what would have made the most difference. And one of the things I guess they wanted to feel was they just wanted to feel that all of this stuff that was going on was not okay. They wanted to feel your outrage. They wanted to feel what this meant to you personally. And so it really struck me that we can define things so differently when we're coming from that ally place, thinking we've got the recipe, but we don't check in. We, we are not steered by those who, be, who are being impacted. And I think that is the definition of allyship. It's like, I am here when you need me, if you need me, 
I'm de- I can be deployed. Think about what I have to deploy. Think about what I um, have access to, um, but to be steered. And, and, and that has to be a balance with, between that. And then when I'm the only one in the room, I'm going to steer, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to be the voice. I'm going to remind everybody. I'm going to point things out. I'm going to be that, you know, phase four advocate in my model. I'm going to be the squeaky wheel and I'm going to be insistent to say, hold on, you know, time out. What we're doing right now is, is, you know, is not, um, is not a good practice. I think sometimes you have to celebrate the wins, like when Barack Obama won, it was a huge turning point for the country. And when you see the Secretary of State and so forth and say, gosh, we're really on the right path here, because when you just don't acknowledge those wins, uh, then it frustrates the people who think, hey, I'm really making a difference. And you keep telling me I'm not making a difference here. Yeah. And and I think it takes you backwards instead of forwards. Here's Mark, can I thing. can I say I just yes. want to build on that recognizing allyship when you see it when you receive it is so important. Point it out to people. Like if you're listening to this and or, or if you're the ally, like ask for the feedback. Was that helpful? But I I always try to say that what you just said. I never hear that out of somebody's mouth that looks like you. Thank you, thank you, and and it really made a difference. You know, it's clear that you care. It's clear that you did your homework. It's clear that you're trying. And if it's not perfect, that might be an opportunity for me to say, to take you aside and call you in, not call you out, call you in and say, you know, um, we, we say this differently, or I might suggest a different wording, or I totally appreciate your effort. Here's what I might do differently next time. So, but call in these aspiring allies and, and, and give a lot of space and grace for learning. That is so important. We all want grace you know, we, I don't show up perfectly. I've been called in. I so appreciate the kindness that people have shown me to take a moment and teach me something that I can shift or modify. Uh, this is uh, a, a change to this conversation we have, but in the book, you mentioned Ed Stack, CEO of Dick's Sporting Goods, decision to stop selling uh, assault rifles. And I, I thought it took tremendous political and economic courage for him to go and do this. I mean, you just don't find people to talk about it, mm. but they really won't do it. What impact did that have over time on their reputation and their bottom line? Yeah, it's really fascinating to track back to, you know, threatened boy- boycotts, things like that. And actually they have really not been shown over time to impact in any measurable way uh, brands. And in fact, It probably wins more loyalty and broadens the potential customer base and audience um, in unexpected ways. Um, You know, Gillette had a really powerful um, ad. I don't know if anybody ever saw that ad, but uh, around uh, toxic masculinity. And it was fascinating. They went back in time and re-aired some of their old ads. And they were basically as a brand saying, hey, that was us then. This is us now. And, and by the way, remember Gillette's addressable market includes all kinds of people of all kinds of identities. So recognizing brands too, like going back and acknowledging here's the harm that may, we may have caused because it, is, it was a different time. And then proactively kind of leaning into that today wins a lot of new attention and, uh, and potential customers. So I think net net, I mean, I'd have to, I, I can't answer you with stats, but what I have read is that, um, you know, these are going to happen. But I think, again, brands need to be out ahead. And to me, out ahead means, you know, we are paying attention to the zeitgeist and we're, we're making hard choices for the future. We're seeing into the future where this is going. Um, and a lot of them are, are revisiting. I mean, you saw a bunch of brands change a lot of harmful stereotypes and all of their ads and logos and all that stuff really was questioned over the last couple of years. And, and I, I, I think brands are better for it. I, I think Hollywood can, has had a, a tremendous positive impact mm. when you see um, women, uh, uh, LGBT community, mm-hmm. uh, people, black, brown in leadership roles on shows, you know, the, the lieutenant, the head of the FBI, you know, all these things. And it reinforces that why couldn't they be uh, in those roles? And why wouldn't we want them to be in these roles? Because you want to have to aspire to, to greatness uh, and to achieve because you'll have less 
you know, in Philadelphia, we have a lot of shootings of teenagers killing each other because mm. they don't value themselves and, and therefore they don't value the other person. Mm. But these things are helpful. I even think like when Tony Soprano was seeing a therapist, <laughs> I think a lot of conversation came up and, and people, even though he was a fictitious, uh, fictional character, I think it opened up the conversation mm. for people thinking that that was okay. Right. Uh, Right. Uh, so I think those things happen. I'm just wondering, uh, what leaders do you admire that you feel have fit your definition of inclusiveness in government, business, sports, and or entertainment um, mm -hmm. that you uh, would say to us, you know, these guys, these men and women are good role models for this? Oh, my goodness. Oh, so many. I think there's a I don't follow sports terribly, but there is a player who just moved his family out of Florida, I think, uh, because his, he didn't feel it was a safe place for his kids. Um, you know, you become an unlikely leader for things that you don't even expect when you do the right thing for your, yourself and your family. And, and that story just really struck me. Um, I think he has a gender non-binary kid. Um, but even families that, you know, don't like, this is what's happening with States, um, that, you know, that it's not just people who are directly affected. It's, it's, it's like sort of the collateral damage of some of these, uh, policies. So I think the leaders who are, are, um, also companies that are standing up for their, um, employee benefits, their health benefits for women. Um, some of these CEOs, perhaps, you know, things are being done quietly, but, um, other times, you know, it's, it's more public, um, making sure the employees are protected all around the world. Um, you know, some of these companies and the CEO is like, it comes down to the Mark Benioffs of the world is somebody I really admire at Salesforce. Um, and you said in the book that he kept struggling because yeah. he kept thinking he was getting the women parity <laughs> and pay. And then he'd find out, well, this, I'm still not doing that. In fact, they're even falling further behind than when I started this process. I know, how depressing, right? Yeah, the story yeah. You're, you're referencing is Mark Benioff um, did the pay equity uh, yeah. and, and found the gender pay gap, which is exists in every organization, particularly up towards the top, um, and then rectified it, right? It wrote a giant check to gross up all of the women's pay that was under mark, market and under par. Um, but then as Salesforce, as it does, acquired more and more companies, um, the pay, the, their numbers would go down because every company they acquired would have, would have their own pay gap. So you address it here. It's like whack-a-mole, like you address it here and then it would continue to pop up, which is, which is understandable, right? That's kind of where we're at. And, um, but just a leader who would go on the news and talk about how he would say, I was shocked and I was embarrassed. I mean, I was ashamed I, in my own organization that this was happening under my nose. And I didn't even know. And, and that to me is beautiful leadership because it is not, I'm smart. I have all the answers. I'm in control, whatever. It is literally like, I didn't know. This is how I felt about it, which is angry, <laughs> frustrated. Um, and here's what I did about it. And not just writing a check, but what I also love is their pay equity. Um, they look at it over and over and over again. So it was not a Band-Aid. This was a sort of deep cleanse that they do organizationally. And, you know, I know they've improved their numbers. No organization is where they need to be, but just role modeling that process and other CEOs seeing that and in tech, for example, and saying like, well, we don't do that. Well, I wonder what our pay gap is. Well, you know, some people saying, well, we don't have a pay gap, <laughs> which believe me, many leaders still think is true, but it's actually statistically almost impossible for it to be true. Um, so, I, so just love I that. Mean, I love that he did that. I, I, when I was asking about a leader, one of the things that did come to my mind was um, Vince Lombardi, the great football coach for mm. Green Bay. Um, he found out um, in when he first took over Green Bay that uh, one of the players was gay. Mm. And, and he only found this out because three of the players came to him and said that they wanted this guy out. Mm. And so he said, let's meet as a team. And he brought them together as a team. And he told uh, the entire team that if they had a problem playing with a gay player, let them know because they'd be traded that day. Woo! Leadership. And what they didn't know that was his brother was gay. Oh, and so, God. and then when he became more powerful as the um, Super Bowl winning coach year after year, Mm -hmm. And uh, his players couldn't stay in the same hotel in North Carolina, those black players. He told the NFL, I guess we're not playing in North Carolina mm -hmm. until that changes. Incredible. So 
that is a great statement uh, for people to make. So I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this important topic. And I hope people will be reading your book. And when you come out with another book, you'll have to let me know so we can have you back on again. Oh, thank you. Oh gosh, I we're barely recovered from the last one. <laughs> I, I hear I've written six books. And I know how you know. <laughs> exhausting that is. It is. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend and, and thanks again for participating. Thanks so much.